Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Continuous Integration is for Teams, Moving Past Buzzword-Driven Development. Your speakers for today are Steve Persh, Agency and Community Engineer here at Pantheon, along with our guest speaker, Rob Bayless, CTO at Last Call Media. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we start. Please make sure you submit any questions you have during the presentation in the question window, or tweet them at GetPantheon. We will answer as many of the questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's presentation. Also, the web webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be made available to everyone next week. I'd now like to turn it over to Rob and Steve. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Persh, Agency and Community Engineer here at Pantheon. You can find me on the internet as Steve Ector, GitHub, Twitter, WordPress.org, Drupal.org. So in my position at Pantheon, I work primarily with agencies that are adopting Pantheon in one way or another. I also get to do a lot of community outreach going to Drupal and WordPress events and meetups. And I also get to do a lot of open source coding. So in my position here at Pantheon, I do some maintenance of our WordPress and Drupal modules and plugins. And I'm mainly focused on our continuous integration scripts for those repositories. And I'm happy to be joined here by Rob Bayless. Hey, uh, thanks for the intro, Steve. Uh, I'm the CTO at Last Call Media. Uh, I've been doing Drupal development for about seven years, and I've worked on several kind of enterprise scale builds, uh, including the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, these days, I spend most of my time like consulting and uh, dealing with organizations that want to get better at uh, doing development. So I consult and talk about best practices, continuous delivery, that sort of thing. Um, as a company, we were early adopters of Drupal 8. Uh, we signed on, let's see, we launched our, our Drupal 8 site in January of 2014. So that was uh, Alpha 14. And we've been at, with it ever since. Uh, so yeah, uh, my primary focus is on kind of scaling the company here, and so that means taking our development practices and making sure that they're sustainable and that we can uh, do the same thing that we were doing with two people now that we have 25 people. That's who I am. Well, thanks, Rob. Uh, so in a few minutes, Rob will be showing us uh, one of their real projects uh, using Drupal 8, using continuous integration. Uh, it's really exciting for me uh, to see what a, a real project looks like in my role at Pantheon. I get to, to build up a lot of tooling around Drupal 8 in particular, and it's, it's exciting to see it in practice on, on a real client site. So today we're talking about continuous integration. And on a literal level, continuous integration means frequently combining all of the elements of your website. What we have here is a quote from Josh Koenig, one of the Pantheon co-founders, a blog post he wrote recently about continuous integration. Fundamentally, what we're talking about is combining our code with our database, our real-world content, uh, media files, anything involved in the website, and, and doing that in a deliberate fashion that, that makes us more productive. So continuous integration naturally assumes that we have some compilation or building to be done. And it assumes that this step, this compilation or building, is going to take some significant non-trivial amount of time. And this is very familiar uh, to all sorts of software developers. This is where we get that classic XKCD cartoon that the all-purpose coder excuse is that your code is compiling. It's building, you've got some separation between your source code and the usable compiled artifact that, that can be run. Now, as a web developer, when I first saw this cartoon, it didn't exactly click for me because as a web developer years ago, uh, I didn't have what felt like a compilation step. And, and to explain what I mean, I want to jump into a truncated PHP-centric history of the World Wide Web and web development in general. So in the beginning, websites were simply HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and assets. And spoiler it, uh, this is what websites pretty much still are. Fundamentally, websites still are HTML, CSS, JavaScript, assets. Things have gotten more complicated, but the internet we had in the 90s was built with the same fundamental tools we have now. The main difference, at least as it pertains to continuous integration, is that years and years ago, it was normal for web 
masters, uh, as we called ourselves back then, to work directly with those raw materials that were getting sent to the server. So this here is the Space Jam website made in the late 90s. It's still on the internet. You can take a look at it. And it's basic HTML, some basic CSS, some basic JavaScript, and uh, image files, audio clips from the movie. And it's likely that the web developers who built the site were working directly with those HTML files. If you were making websites in the late 90s, you were probably working directly with the HTML files that were going to get sent to the browser. You could edit an HTML file, edit a CSS file, hit refresh in your browser, and instantly see the change. There wasn't a long compilation to be done. A few years uh, into the internet, we got PHP and other interpreted languages. These allowed us to get more complex in the way we built our websites. We could build in logic on the server side. We could start using more and more templating tools to build more and more complex websites. However, one of the great parts about PHP is that it's an interpreted language, meaning it's basically compiling or performing its logic on demand. So uh, sites built with PHP, CMSs like Drupal and WordPress, don't have uh, natively a, a, a long compile step. The great part about PHP is that the compiling, the processing of PHP just happens on demand. So you can still work directly with that PHP that's getting uploaded to your server and feel like you're working with the raw material. Edit your PHP file, hit refresh, and instantly see the change in your web page. The same dynamic is basically present with CSS and JavaScript, and, and even things like image assets. Drupal and WordPress have built-in ways of optimizing or aggregating, as, as Drupal calls it, your CSS and, and JavaScript, and that's a, a way of uh, improving the, the way the browser processes the CSS or JavaScript, but the web developer can work directly with uh, the raw CSS or raw JavaScript and get immediate feedback just by refreshing the browser. But of course, things got more and more complicated. With uh, CSS, developers started to prefer working with SAS, which did have its own compilation step. CoffeeScript, uh, as, a, as a way of writing JavaScript in a different form, also requiring some compilation. Drush Make uh, was a common tool for managing large sets of contributed modules and, and had to be processed and downloaded to give you a, a usable set of PHP code. So, this is where the, the Drupal community and the WordPress community started feeling the need for more and more well-defined build steps. So we're still producing web pages that are, are just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We still have uh, our Drupal or WordPress site that expects to have CSS, expects to have JavaScript. Our Git repositories that developers are interacting with, though, probably contain SAS or CoffeeScript uh, in addition to or instead of the compiled CSS or compiled JavaScript. And then uh, we get these difficult questions like who owns the CSS and exactly how does the CSS get sent to the web page? If we're writing our CSS really in SAS and that's what we're version controlling, do we still give the CMS this intermediate step of CSS that Drupal or WordPress will then optimize and, and further aggregate? Or because SAS has these concepts on its own, do we just go straight from our raw SAS to optimized CSS and skip over the built-in tools of the CMS? Uh, as the build steps get more and more complicated, developers have more and more questions that they have to address. And these, these questions can be big distractors for a team. And of course, things got even more complicated as Composer uh, came onto the scene, especially in the, the Drupal community, as well as now the WordPress community. And of course, in the front end community, we have these dependency managers like Bower and uh, NPM giving us more and more uh, complicated ways of managing larger and larger sets of code. So a lot of developers use a, a flow that looks something like this. In a Git repository, we have our list of composer dependencies or NPM dependencies, and we have our custom code that we've written in PHP or various front end languages. Those then get compiled to perhaps a, a local copy of the website or a development copy of the website that contains what's needed to run the site in production and maybe some additional development tools, maybe some task runners. That can then compile into what's uh, ready to be a live site without the, the development tools, just your production PHP and your production ready front end assets. And then finally, Drupal or WordPress is compiling 
uh, a website to be sent to browsers. So this is getting very, very complicated, and it, it can feel very overwhelming for a team. There are just a ton of tools to keep track of now, and it's, it's very difficult to even keep track of what problem is each tool solving. Here I think it's very helpful to remember this nugget of wisdom from Martin Fowler. Continuous integration is all about communication. So Martin Fowler is, is one of the early thinkers in the continuous integration philosophy. He wrote uh, basically the, the definitive post on continuous integration. And it contains a number of guidelines that get interpreted in a, in a very technical way. So these are all those guidelines, and I really want to highlight two of them up here. Automate the build and make your build self-testing. So those are, are two technical things to be done. Automate your build. Automate the way you move from that Git repository with your composer dependencies, uh, your NPM dependencies. Automate the way you move from that repository to a usable website. And the, the key for me is that by doing that, you improve your developer's communication. You improve the communication on the whole team. Because without that step being automated, it'll be all the development team talks about. If every person on the team has a different way of compiling SAS or running Composer, that's going to result in all kinds of communication and it'll, it'll be a never ending topic of conversation. So by automating your build, you improve the communication that the team has. By making your build self-testing, which is something we'll see from Rob in, in just a minute here, we can improve the conversations that developers have. Every time a, co a code change is made, it's normal now for developers to make a pull request for that code change. By automating the testing, uh, that you're doing. By making your build self-testing, you can check things like uh, that PHP standards are met, that you have the correct tabs or spacing that are expected for the project, and then the developers reviewing the code change can simply have a better conversation because they know those baseline expectations are met because those were automatically tested by your um, self-testing build. I now want to talk about the relationship of continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment, because these often get all mixed up together. These are distinct concepts that, that build on one another. So first, let's just review what, what we mean by continuous integration. I think fundamentally what we mean by continuous integration is talking about how we get that functioning copy of our software. So if what we want is a functioning copy of our website, well, we need, of course, functioning code, PHP, CSS, JavaScript. That's coming in some way, shape, or form from our source repository, likely a Git repository. So that's compiling through any number of, of steps, any number of tests get run in between here. For a functioning website, we probably need our database and media files. Those are mo most likely coming in the form of a backup from our, our live site in some way, shape, or form. It's possible that your continuous integration process simply does a fresh install of the database, but one way or another, we get a database, and, uh, and one way or another, we get our server environment. What version of Nginx are we running? What version of PHP? How is our file system working? And this could be coming from any number of places. If you're doing everything on Pantheon, where we simply provide you the server environment. If you're working with Circle CI, uh, which we'll see in a minute, you may have to do some definition of the server environment that you want. So with continuous integration, we're simply talking about how do we take all of our pieces and assemble them into a functioning website. Let's now look at how we build onto that concept with continuous delivery. With continuous delivery, we need the concept of a build pipeline. How do we take one of those functioning copies of our, our software and get it out to production. The idea of a build pipeline or a, a deployment pipeline is defining exactly how we move from development to live. And on Pantheon, we provide a build, a deployment pipeline for you. We suggest moving from multi-dev, which is basically a development or QA environment for each Git branch into a central dev environment. This is tied to your master branch. From there, you can go to a test environment to do one final round of, of testing, perhaps some uh, in-person human review before finally deploying out to live. And it's normal for a lot of agencies using Pantheon to do those deployments on a weekly, 
bi-weekly, monthly schedule. So that's continuous delivery, defining exactly your uh, build pipeline, what steps run, uh, what tests run with each step. Building onto that once more, continuous deployment. This is uh, a really hot topic because it's, it's such an interesting idea. With continuous deployment, once a certain point is passed, changes are deployed all the way out to live. So if you were to do continuous deployment on Pantheon, what you would probably be doing is agreeing that once you've merged from multi-dev into dev, as long as your automated tests are passing, you're immediately proceeding through that uh, deployment pipeline that you defined in continuous delivery all the way out to your live environment. So to be doing continuous deployment, you need to be extremely confident in your automated tests and this is ultimately a business decision for all the stakeholders to make. Do you want all of your changes to go out straight to live as soon as they're merged to the master branch, or do you want to hold them until uh, the sprint has ended? So at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Rob and take a look at the real continuous integration process of a Last Call Media project. So I will get the presenter changed over to you, Rob. And you should be able to, to screen share in just a second here. Okay. All right. And I'm just pulling up the slide here. Great, so uh, I just want to talk briefly about kind of our workflow before I go into the task. Um, and our workflow is probably pretty standard for a lot of web organizations out there. Uh, we do all of our work in feature branches, which means nothing ever gets committed to master until it's actually ready to go. Uh, so if we have a change, it's gonna get committed to that feature branch and pushed up to GitHub. Uh, we do manage our repositories externally to Pantheon, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, when it, the feature branch makes it to GitHub, uh, gets automatically tested. We use Circle CI for that, and assuming that those tests pass, it's going to go directly over to Pantheon Multidev. So there's going to be an environment created for it, and we're going to be able to preview it in person as soon as uh, those tests are completed. Assuming everything looks good there, we're going to issue a PR from the feature branch over to the master branch, and that PR again gets tested uh, by CI to make sure that we uh, have all the expectations met. Uh, along the way here, uh, we do have two repositories in the picture, and I want to talk about the difference here. So we have our source repository, and our source repository is the one that's kept in GitHub. Really all that's committed to the source repository is the custom code and the configuration that's needed to build the final site. Um, so you can see here that compiled assets are not committed, contrib stuff is not committed, no, uh, even Drupal core is not committed to the repository. Now, when Circle CI gets involved, it uses a bunch of dependency management tools like Composer, like Bower, uh, to pull in everything we need. And of course, what we ship to Pantheon needs to include those things. So our build process actually pulls in all of the dependencies at the last possible moment before we ship it to Pantheon. And I think this is a fundamental shift in kind of the way Drupal sites are built uh, that we're going to be seeing a lot in Drupal 8. Come back to that slide. Um, so I just want to walk through uh, kind of a sample deployment. Uh, we have a client site here. Uh, this is the Albright Knox Art Gallery. Albright Knox is located in Buffalo, New York. And I just want to give a shout out to Pam, who is on this uh, webinar right now. Um, so this site is beautiful. It's a Drupal 8 site that's been recently finished. And they've asked us 
fictionally, of course, to make a change to the exhibitions block on the home page. Now, we don't actually want to make this change on their production site because this is a fictional task. So I've gone ahead and created a sort of alternate stand-in for live environment here on Pantheon. So we have this P master branch and our goal is to get this exhibitions block so that it has two exhibitions shown. And then we also want to make this uh, heading right here a little bit smaller and italic. So I've gone ahead and pushed up one way we could make this change. And this is a pull request that I've created on the repository in GitHub. If we look at the, the file changes that are here, we can see that there is a configuration change. So this being a Drupal 8 site is the YAML file. And we can see that we've reduced the number of items per page on the exhibitions view from 12 to 2. Additionally, we've got our style change for the heading, and that's made in SAS. And so we've added a style rule here that says an H2 on this site should be font size 1.4 rem, and we've got some importance in here. And of course, uh, this is not a great change. Uh, I left some comments here for whatever crazy developer made this change. H2 is way too broad of a selector, so we want to change that. And we've also uh, specified important, which is definitely not best practice. So looking at this pull request, it would be ideal if those sorts of changes were, um, or those sorts of issues were called out automatically. So if we look at our circle build, <clears throat> we can see that it failed and we can see exactly why it failed right on circle. So there are a number of CI services out there, um, one of which is Circle CI. We chose Circle CI for a couple of reasons. Number one is the, the YAML file support and the fact that you can version control your, your build process and have it change over time. That's going to be really important as you add new steps to the build. You want to be able to send that in through a pull request the same way you send anything else in. Uh, so over here in CircleCI, we have a nice output of what the failures were. And we can see that there's a design deviation on a couple of different pages. Uh, the footer of the home page is having some issues. And if we look in the artifacts for this build, we're going to get a nice HTML report showing us exactly what happened. So we can see here that the subscribe to our monthly news uh, email newsletter, and this is the, the mobile version of it, uh, also changed. We weren't expecting that. So what you're seeing on the left is a reference screenshot that is how we believe it's supposed to look. What you're seeing in the middle is how it does look following our changes. And what you're seeing on the right is the difference of those two. Just scrolling through a few more of these changes, we can see that uh, they really break things in a way we weren't expecting. So I'm going to go back to this pull request. And we're going to go ahead and issue a change here. Just going to make it right on GitHub. We really love GitHub because uh, it has a, such a nice interface and the, uh, the pull request model is very important to our workflow. We want to make sure that anything that goes out to a site goes through both automated processes like we're seeing here and also you know code review by a developer. So I've gone ahead and removed those importance. I've switched that selector back to something a little more sane. And I'll just leave a, kind of a useless commit message. We're going to commit those changes. And I'm going to go back to this pull request and we're going to watch this build happen and step through. Uh, 
so while this is working, I'm going to additionally pull up to circle.yaml. And I do obviously just want to point out that circle is one tool that you can use here. Uh, there are several others if you're not comfortable with this. Uh, so this YAML file has a number of configuration items in it. Uh, the first one is machine, and then you have dependencies, database, test, and deployment. Each of those correspond to sort of sections of the build. And over here on our build, we can see that the infrastructure part, meaning where we're setting up the machine, corresponds back to the machine definition here. Really, our goal for the machine definition is to get as close to the deployment environment as we can. And uh, what we've done is specify that we're going to have PHP 704, which is what the production site is using. Down here under dependencies, it's going through these steps right now. And we have one step where we require terminus. We're going to need terminus in just a second. We log in to Terminus so that we can issue commands against the site as we need. And then we use NPM to grab our build dependencies. Um, I'm going to provide a repo at the end of this where people can go to kind of see all these pieces because there's a whole lot here. But really, what you need to know for right now is that we're, we're grabbing the build dependencies and all of the uh, site dependencies using npm and this gulp install task actually goes through and runs composer install and bower install. So again, we don't have any of that external code committed to the repo. We're grabbing it all on the fly based on our definitions of the versions that things need to be. So uh, that again is sort of a fundamental shift toward treating these outside dependencies more as black boxes that we put our input into and we get our, our output from. Uh, so once we've gotten through the dependencies step, we're going to grab a database and we're actually going to set up a working site on Circle. Uh, to do that, we're going to use Terminus. And one of the really nice features of Terminus is that it'll, it allows you to grab the latest uh, database cut from any environment without affecting that environment. So that means you don't actually need to take a snapshot live as you're grabbing it. It's already taken and you're just downloading it. So you can see here that the command to do that only took us seven seconds. So that's not bad. Uh, the command to actually import the database takes slightly longer. Um, but we use Drupal console. No, sorry, we're using Drush here. Uh, we do use Drupal console in some places. Uh, and I think that those tools are more or less interchangeable <clears throat> at this point. So once we get through that database step, we're into the meat of the build. And this is where we're going to do all the really important things. Uh, you can see that we're running gulp commands. And gulp is a JavaScript task runner that probably some of you are familiar with. Uh, we chose gulp over something like Grunt or Webpack, mostly because it allows you to define subtasks. So in our gulp file for this project, we've defined a couple of top level tasks that are really important and we want to be able to, to use consistently across all of our projects. We have an install task that runs anything install related for this project. And again, we saw that that was Composer and Bower. We have a check task that's going to run any of the static code analysis steps. So none of those actually require a site to be set up. And then we have a test task that's going to run any of the sort of functional testing steps that we need to run for this site. And so here we're using uh, bhat, we're using backstop.js, which is the visual regression tool that you saw a moment ago. And we also have uh, performance tests specified so that 
you know, we can load up the home page and assert that it only makes a certain number of requests or whatever. And we have that stuff outputting JUnit uh, format, which is what we were seeing at the top of that failed build, where it gave us the really nice output of, you know, sort of each thing that failed. And that's, again, one of the things we really like about CircleCI is that ability to, to grab the JUnit output and also capture those, those artifacts from it. So our database is finished importing, and we're walking through the test steps. Uh, we are expecting these to pass once that H2 has been fixed. So uh, we do, we set up the, the web server. So we just use the built-in web server uh, in Drupal console rather than bootstrapping something like Apache. That's just for simplicity's sake. We run our static code analysis, and we can see that we have a couple of warnings in here, but nothing really serious. Nothing actually errored out, so this, this step passed. And now we're down to probably the most important part, which is the testing steps. Um, and you can see those subtasks running here, BHAT, backstop, and performance testing. We're uh, crossing our fingers that things pass, and they did. So at this point, we've moved on to deployment. And deployment is, I think, the most interesting part of this. For any branch that starts with a p-anything on our builds, uh, we push that to a Pantheon multi-dev instance. So we assume that that's a feature branch. So we have a deployment section for multi-dev deployment that specifies the branch that it needs to match and then the commands that it runs. And here we're, again, installing those dependencies, but this time we reinstall the dependencies, excluding any of the development ones. So we want the leanest possible build that we can send up. And we're actually going to optimize the autoloader auto as well. So this is a nice sort of easy performance win for us. Down here, we make sure that a multi-dev environment exists for this branch. And if it doesn't, we actually create it. So we're using Terminus pretty heavily in this build. Then last but not least, we actually run this push the downstream stream script that will rsync our code base over to uh, a new clone of the Pantheon repository, switch out the git ignore with one that is um, useful for an artifact, and push that to Pantheon. I just want to show briefly the difference between our git ignore and our artifact git ignore. And again, these are things that are going to be included in the repository that I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, so this is our standard git ignore, and you can see that we ignore every contrib module, all of the composer dependencies, and all of the build tools. Over here on the artifacts git ignore, we're excluding those build tools still, but you can see that we are committing uh, the contrib modules, the, the composer dependencies, etc. So looks like everything went well. And we should see our changes at this point on the new multi-dev instance on Pantheons. And so, we take a look at that. It's going to take a moment to bootstrap because we did just run, uh, as we pushed, we also have Quicksilver hooks on the Pantheon side to do a config revert and a cache rebuild, as well as uh, run database updates. So those are things that we want to be consistent as we pass from our environment to environment in Pantheon. That kind of is our deployment process. And we really want to make it so that when we hit the deploy button on Pantheon, we're always getting the same steps run. So what we can see here is that we do have uh, something missing, but that our current and upcoming exhibitions block does show in italics now. So our changes did make it 
we had a snag on the deployment of the um, the the view, the number of items in the view, but no big deal. That's why we have uh, the multi dev environment. So at this point, assuming everything went well, I would go back to this pull request and. Of course, had I truly done this as a, a real task, I would not be approving my own pull request. But since this is um, a demo, I'm going to just merge this. And as soon as this goes back to that PMaster branch, uh, it's going to run our, our circle build. And as soon as that finishes, we're going to have our changes in the dev environment. So from there, it's just a push button deployment from dev to test to, to live. So really nice and simple and keeps things really uh, consistent and easy to deploy. So I'm not going to watch this whole build happen. We're going to step back over to the slides for a moment. Uh, and I do want to talk about sort of the lessons we've learned. We, we started doing CI maybe three years ago. We started dipping our toes into it. And the reason that we started dipping our toes into it is our QA process just got longer and longer and longer. Um, we had you know manual QA happening and our PMs had to, to review every change. A lot of times we'd have those unexpected side effects of deployment and uh, we needed to stop that. We needed to stop it in a consistent way that didn't involve adding time to every task that we do. So we started getting involved uh, with BHAT. That was kind of our, our initial tool that we used. And one of the things we really liked about BHAT is it gave us a nice way to communicate user stories to everyone involved. So you could pass a user story. You know, theoretically, you could run it by a client and say, hey, is this really what you want? And a client could look at it and say, no, nah, that's not quite it. Uh, that same user story would then end up becoming your test. So we really liked that. We got started with just BHAT. And as things progressed, we had, you know, one at a time, we, we implemented like uh, front-end performance testing for a client who wanted uh, a performance budget for their home page. We wanted to make sure that that was always met. Um, visual regression testing is something we've brought in just recently and really has served as, or I think will serve as a powerful tool for us to be able to test a lot of functionality at once. We take on a lot of ongoing support builds and most of the time what that means is that we're taking on sites that we didn't necessarily build. And when you do that, you end up with a lot of code you're not super familiar with. Visual regression testing is one way to just from the outside check on a site-wide basis whether something unexpected happened. Um, so it's a powerful tool to kind of bootstrap onto a site that was not built with testing in mind. So as far as the lessons we've learned and the, the takeaways that we've had as a company, um, I would definitely say starting small is a good idea. Uh, again, we just started with VHAT and we, we just kind of had that running. And that was one small assurance every time we pushed that we weren't breaking whatever we had tested. Once that was there, it was much easier for us to kind of add things. And so that sort of speaks to this point of continuous delivery being a process. It's not really something that's ever done. It's just something that you use. It's a process that you follow. And as soon as you start following it, one of the really nice things is you can build on it over time. So it just gets better and better and better. Um, as far as the tools you pick, it's kind of, it's arbitrary really. Uh, which ones you use, but I would definitely point people toward the more flexible ones. BHAT is a really good example. You can use it for JavaScript testing. You can use it for command line tool testing. 
I mean, we have a, a BHAT step that's run on all of our sites to make sure that Drush can bootstrap the site. So that's just a really simple, really quick uh, way that we can we can use BHAT to like test things that you wouldn't even expect BHAT to test. So you really want to prioritize learning and using those those flexible tools over more single use ones. Uh, the front end performance testing tool that we use, uh, it's called Phantomos, and it's built on Phantom JS. So that's a really good tool, but it's it's not really flexible. It does one thing and it does it pretty well. So definitely start with something like BHAT before you get into those more single use things. And then finally, just make sure you educate yourself about the testing process. Um, you want to know the difference between a unit test, a functional test, uh, what you need to test with JavaScript, what you need to test with uh, you know, behavioral driven development, whatever. Uh, it's, it's a learning process and it's really never ending the same way as development is. Uh, just to wrap this up, this is at the bottom here the link to the scaffold tool that we use. Uh, it's got pretty much all of the scripts that I've shown as well as uh, sample circle.yaml that's very similar to the one we just walked through. So it's a, a way you can kind of get up and running with all of this stuff pretty quickly. Uh, so yeah, that's about it for me. Um, I think we're on to questions at this point. Yes, we are. Uh, thank you both so much. Steve, I just gave presenter rights over to you again. Um, for anyone who has questions, please begin submitting them now. Um, we have our first question. And that is, um, how does Backstop know that the changes you've made in the H2 exhi exhibition block is as it should be? Why is the test passing since the style is different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the reason that the test is actually passing in this case is because we didn't have a test for the exhibitions block. Uh, so in, you know, a real use case here, we would have written a test for the um, for the exhibition block and we would have created uh, what are called reference screenshots for it. Uh, so reference screenshots are the screenshots that you commit to the repository that tell Backstop exactly what it should look like. So we had those reference screenshots for the, the footer and we did not have them for the exhibitions block. Alrighty. Next question is, um, can you use Circle CI directly on Pantheon's repos, or do you have to slash is it best to do this externally? So Circle CI ends up being an integration. So one of the reasons Last Call uses it, and a lot of the the example repositories that Pantheon maintains on on GitHub use Circle CI is because. Pantheon doesn't offer a, a product that does that same thing, which is let you run arbitrary build steps. So if, if you're working in this fashion of having an external repository on GitHub because you want the pull requests, GitHub gives you um, all the other integrations. GitHub gives you, uh, if you're using a repository like that, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea to have something that will automatically send changes in the GitHub repository over to Pantheon. And uh, CircleCI is, is just one of the, the ways you can do that. Uh, I should also mention that uh, our product team is actively thinking about this question, about how best to do external repository integration. Uh, it's just not something that's um, been fully defined yet. Uh, on a product level. So right now it's uh, it's an incumbent on individual web development teams to decide exactly how they want to do that integration. All right, next question is, how do you handle consistent VRT when you are making a CSS change that is intentionally changing the look of a site? I would have expected uh, the second sample PR to fail because the look of the heading for the block changed. 
Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And again, that, that goes back to the fact that I did not have a visual regression test for that block itself. Um, as far as the consistency uh, across the board, um, one of the nice things about committing your reference screenshots to the repository is that they're then available to the pull request, and they show up as a code change there. So as someone that's making a change, as I make, let's say I really did want to update the H2 for the entire site, I would update the reference screenshots locally. So the, the new reference screenshots would show all of those updates. And the updated screenshots would be available for me to view as a reviewer in the PR. So I would be able to see at a glance exactly what it should look like uh, following the style changes. And the fact that the test pass would also mean that it does look like that. All right, uh, next question is, can you repeat the name and maybe a link to the visual regression tool you're using? Yes, definitely. Uh, uh, so as for the, sorry, as for the link, um, I can include that in the recording email that you will all receive next week. But um, Rob, if you can repeat the name of that tool. Yeah, yeah the tool is Backstop.js. Perfect. Um, the next question is, how do you handle hot fixes or small changes with CI? Do you also use the same testing process? I just one note on hot fixing with Pantheon. If you do need to get some kind of change out immediately on, on Pantheon and you want to skip around the development environment, just the actual mechanism for doing that on Pantheon is git tags. So if you're using the, the Pantheon dashboard to do deployments, the normal way it's a series of uh, a button clicks basically to take code from dev to test to live. What's happening on the Git level as you use our dashboard to go from dev to test to live is that a new Git tag is being made for each deployment to test or live. Uh, so if you want to go straight to test or straight to live, you just have to make the appropriately named Git tag and push that. Uh, there's another part of, of that question that, that I think I'm hearing of, of what if you need to, to change live immediately and your build process uh, takes 10 minutes or, or 15 minutes. Uh, that's one of the reasons I, I'm happy Pantheon still uses Git as the deployment mechanism on, on our end of things. Uh, I think it, it gives you the option of, of going directly into that Pantheon repository if, if what we're talking about is a one-line CSS change and your client demands it be made right this second. Uh, you can, uh, of course, still just go directly to Pantheon, make the code, ch code change and deploy um, just using Pantheon's tooling and, and skip around your, your CI processes. So it's, it's up to you um, to, to answer the question of, is this hotfix being requested so critical that we, we want to circumvent our CI processes? And, and also just the, the likelihood of this question is, I think strong encouragement to make your CI processes as fast as possible, so that uh, so that you aren't thinking, well, our CI process takes an hour. Uh, there's no way we can wait for that. We have to skip around all of our processes. Ideally, the the CI process you have can run fast enough so that um, it's it's acceptable to to do even a, a critical fix through those normal CI processes that you've defined. Yeah, the other, I definitely agree with everything you just said. The other thing that I would add is uh, we've looked into creating like a skip tests option for the CI, and mm -hmm. it's not something we've implemented yet, but uh, I think it probably will happen soon where you may just want to skip the, the actual testing phase and just have the artifact be built and shipped to Pantheon right away. You mm -hmm. wouldn't want that used very often, but... Uh, yeah. Circle CI does have the option to skip its processing entirely. That's that's something I do sometimes if I'm um, 
changing white space and and I know it's it's not going to result in a, a difference in the build compared to to my last commit but I still want to push it up um, you can add in your git com git commit message uh, CI space skip in in square brackets and that will just signal to circle CI don't process this commit all right, this question is for Rob, and that is building a new server for every PR seems like a lot of overhead. Do you have a policy on grouping PRs or shortening builds for small commits? Um, I guess we're talking about building a new multi-dev for each change. And uh, no, we don't have a real policy on that. Um, we do it, and we just clean up the environments as we go. Uh, Pantheon makes it really nice and easy and and you know there's, there's no cost to creating a new environment so until you get up to the limit which I think is like 10 mm -hmm. you know, there, there's no downside to creating an extra environment there yeah and I should point out that that limit on 10 multi dev environments is a soft limit that we have in place to prevent against spam abuse. So if you're on a project that just has a ton of branches and you need more multi-dev environments, you can simply let our support team know and they'll uh, bump the limit to something higher. And, uh, and, and that's something we, we even have in place for some of our open source repos where every single time a pull request is made, every single time a build runs, just like in, in this case, a new Pantheon multi-dev is made um, specifically for that um, for that build, which which may be Rob even one step more aggressive than I think what you're showing here, which was Pantheon multi dev environment per branch on on GitHub, and yeah, some of our um, plugins and modules go one step further, which is Pantheon multi dev environment per Circle CI build. So we, we basically just get multi devs that are numbered numbered matching um, the circle CI build runs so we yeah we just spin up a new Pantheon multi dev environment every time and then we have a script that deletes the older ones to um, to keep the number below the cap all right next question is for Steve and that is uh, is there a list of preferred CI tools like circle CI or code ship that work better with Pantheon than others potential integration with Quicksilver, et cetera? Sure, so there's not one centralized list. There's uh, just the fact that a lot of our own repositories use Circle CI for this step. Uh, on the Quicksilver side of things, we, um, we have some Quicksilver examples that show uh, Jenkins integration. And I should let everyone know what, what we mean by Quicksilver is the Pantheon product that lets you um, do scripted steps along with deployments. So when Pantheon sees you make that uh, deployment from dev to test, it can run a script that maybe calls back out to Jenkins or calls back out to Circle CI. Uh, so Quicksilver can run on steps like deployment. Uh, just on every code push, it can run things. Uh, it can run on every cache clear, every time you make a new multi-dev environment, uh, every time you move a database from one environment to another. So uh, I, I think we'll include in the links some of these example repositories that we have that show different ways of, of doing it. We're working on one repository in particular that's a, a Drupal 8 example, and Circle CI has been our, our main focus for that repository. But I know there's uh, someone who, who doesn't even work at Pantheon, who just likes or prefers GitLab, uh, who's been maintaining a GitLab file that basically does all the same steps. Um, all right, next question is, um, you briefly mentioned Quicksilver. Could you please explain what that was? Sure. I, I think what what I just said was, was probably a full enough answer, <laughs> Rob. Do you think I, I should mention anything else? Oh, maybe one, one thing I did mention was, uh, well, yeah, I did the, the Quicksilver examples repository um, on, on GitHub will, will give you a, a bunch of examples for what you can use with Quicksilver. Right. Yeah, those, the Quicksilver examples are really great. And a lot of times we find that all the 
the tasks that we need are in that repo already. So we just mm -hmm. copy them out. Uh, the next question is for Rob, and it's, can you comment on performance tests that you use in your builds, tools you use, how do you define benchmark values to test against? Yeah, so this one is really tricky. Uh, the performance testing that we do on our builds is very limited in scope. Uh, we don't do any sort of load testing in our builds currently, but what we do is front-end testing and we restrict it only to metrics that are not time related. The reason for that is when we're spinning up Circle CI instances, we have no guarantees about the capabilities of that server or the, the match that it's going to be to the production environment. So we don't want to be asserting that on Circle CI you know, the home page loads in one second because that's probably not going to be true on Circle CI. So when we build performance tests, what we look for is things that are not going to change. So for example, the size of the entire home page, how many, you know, including all the assets that it needs to download, the number of requests that it took for the home page. Those things are going to be consistent from the CI environment to the production environment. And so you can, you can test those. And so it's a matter of taking your performance budget. And if it's given in time, you really need to figure out how to convert that into number of requests, uh, size of requests, number of external requests, that sort of thing. And I don't really have a magic formula for that. Um, it's about, finding exactly what the the drive is behind the performance budget and and figuring out how to convert it. Yeah, I can add a bit more information there. One tool that Pantheon has used on an internal project of ours is a tool called sitespeed.io that can measure a lot of the met metrics Rob just mentioned, like the number of requests, the total size of, uh, of the web page, and uh, it also has the, just the concept of a, a budget file. And because we were using this on a site that was already built and we, we essentially wanted to make sure that it didn't uh, degrade, uh, it didn't get uh, any worse, we, we just took the metrics that we had at that point in time, made those the budget, um, and then any pull request would show if we were increasing the number of CSS files, increasing the, the total size of the web page uh, and it could fail the build accordingly. Uh, and then if, if we were like doing much more active work on this site, we could if we wanted to like make those uh, budget metrics progressively more aggressive and use that as a construct for improving the, the site performance, not just guarding against further regression. Yeah, I should probably mention, I think I said this during during the demo, but the tool that we use is PhantomOS, which is uh, built on PhantomJS. And so it sounds very similar to SiteSpeed. Yeah, I think SiteSpeed even under the hood uses PhantomJS. We're probably just talking about different abstraction layers on the same thing. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to sneak a couple more questions in here. This may have been answered already, but just for good measure. How do you mimic the Pantheon environment when testing in Circle? So you can make sure you have things like the same version of PHP. Um, you can use uh, Nginx instead of Apache. Uh, I, I think we might have some detailed write-ups on, on like the, the key pieces. Uh, however, depending on, on the thing you're testing, I think it's, it's unlikely that you're going to, to run into a test fail around like site behavior. Uh, for, for tests like BHAT tests that are verifying the behavior of a Drupal site or a WordPress site, things like when I add this type of note or this type of post, it shows up on these pages that um, really shouldn't vary depending on where the site is being hosted. Of, of course, it's possible for differences in 
PHP versions or, or other implementation details to affect the behavior of the site in one way or another. Uh, I think it's just very unlikely depending on what you're, what you're testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also say that another really beautiful thing about uh, Circle CI and even most hosting or uh, CI providers these days is that they support Docker. So if you're truly concerned with uh, production parity, you probably want to look at the, I think Calamuna has, or Calabox, excuse me, has a couple of Docker images that are really close to the Pantheon production environments. Mm -hmm. So if that's a thing that you want, you could just have Circle CI use those to execute PHP and MySQL and that stuff. Mm -hmm. You could also just test against the Pantheon environment itself. On, on one of my personal projects, I, I do both. I have BHAT tests that run on a Drupal site that has been installed inside of Circle CI, and then I deploy to Pantheon, and then I run even more tests. And uh, if it were a real client project, I, I probably wouldn't be doing that. I was I was doing that mainly for experimentation purposes. But if if you want to make sure that you're testing on something as close as possible to the the real live site, then you can run BHAT tests or your performance tests or, or whatever kind of tests you want um, against the Pantheon multi dev environment. All right, next question. I think either of you can take this, and that's. Are you hireable for a setup, handholding slash get off the ground with this stuff type of service for this CD slash CI workflow? Sure. So I'll, I'll give the the Pantheon answer, <laughs> which is uh, there are a bunch of ways to get in touch with us. Uh, we do office hours twice a week. Uh, I, I think office hours for today already happened this morning, and uh, I was on yesterday uh, in the afternoon, and you can bring any questions you have. Uh, the thing we were doing in office hours yesterday was converting some of our own uh, repositories from using uh, Terminus 0 to Terminus 1.0. That's our command line tool. Uh, and then we also have um, a pair of offerings called Jumpstart and Fast Track, which are more hands-on training sessions for uh, agencies that are either moving over um, a bunch of sites to Pantheon uh, or are referring us regular business. Uh, we also have the Power Users Slack channel and email uh, list, and particularly in, in Slack, there's just a ton of ongoing conversation, um, both amongst Pantheon employees and, uh, and people who use Pantheon about all these kinds of topics. And Rob, yeah. uh, does Last Call do this kind of consulting? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, actually, I get involved with a lot of that stuff. Uh, we consult for a number of organizations and spend a lot of time working with them to kind of build up the pipeline and make sure that they're testing the right things. So, absolutely. And uh, just a plug, I've, uh, we've actually been through the uh, Pantheon, I think it was the Quick Start program, mm -hmm. and it was awesome. We got a lot out of it. All right. Now that we have plugged ourselves and educated everybody, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you all so much for joining us and staying a little over. If you have any questions or feedback, please visit our website where you'll find a contact us page, and we'll put you in touch with the best member of our team. Have a great weekend, everyone. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm.